Hi guys, it's Hannah from Trek It and I'm here in our hub today uh, in Hereford to talk to Dr. Matthew Fuller from Mountain Equipment. So Matthew is the product engineer for Mountain Equipment and he's one of the only people in the world to have a PhD in Down. Now his PhD was entitled The Structure and Properties of Down Feathers uh, and Their Use in the Outdoor Industry. Did I get that right? Spot on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we've had a look at some of the questions on our YouTube channel and we've also taken some feedback off the shop floor too and we've compiled a list of questions just to chat to Matt today about. Yep. Great. Really. Okay, so mm -hmm. why is down such a magical material yeah. when it comes to insulation? It's basically because everything about it has been evolved to make it as warm as possible for as little as possible weight, which is exactly what a mountaineer, an explorer, a hiker wants. Um, they want to have something that's really, really warm and doesn't weigh anything. They also want it to be durable and it does all of these things really well. It's basically because every part of the structure is designed from the ground up or evolved from the ground up um, to trap maximum air and just to remain a stable structure. So the it's got really big fibres that make it lofty and it's got really little fibres that trap all the air and make sure it traps all the different types of heat loss. So it's just, it's about every single part of it. It's not necessarily one little key ingredient. It's just the whole thing is really, really good at it, basically. Wow, I was not prepared. So what are the big do's and don'ts when it comes to looking after your down products? Down products aren't quite as fussy as people think when it comes to care, but you definitely do need to be a bit careful. Um, the big no-no is don't store it wet for long periods because that'll eventually rot the down. It'll take a little while, but if you put it away in a stuff sack soaking wet for you know a couple of weeks, it won't do any good. Um, also, just be careful when you're washing because down can maintain like its loft and stuff fine through washing and all that sort of stuff, but the fabrics it's encased in might struggle. So if you're in particular like, tumble drying and stuff like that, don't get it to let, get too hot because you'll probably ruin a down product if it gets too hot. Um, and when in, in use, yeah, just avoid getting it wet. If it does get wet, you're not going to ruin it. You're not going to sort of cause long-term damage. But once you've got it wet, make sure it's dried out properly before storing it, basically. And when it comes to storing it for things yeah. like sleeping bags and yeah. jackets, mm -hmm. so best to store it out of its stuff? Yeah, like? store it pretty loosely. Um, I mean, like storing stuff compressed for long periods is not going to cause the down any harm, but only if it's dry. Like if, it, if it's got any damp and moisture in it, it's not going to do any good. Um, so that's why people tend to say, you know, store it really loosely, because it just means that it can dry if there's any wetness in it. So yeah, we'd always recommend dry, dry it out and then store it loosely, either like hung on a hanger or, you know, something like that. Don't just ram it under your bed and like crammed up in its storage sack. Like, try to store it a bit more loosely than that. for like six weeks. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so mm. leading on from that then, if I was to store my um, big winter sleeping bag in its yeah. compression sack mm -hmm. uh, for, say, a year until I use it again, yeah. is that going to affect the down in any way? Is it going to lose any of its thermal properties? It probably would be fine. Like, I wouldn't recommend it just for the reason we've mentioned, but it shouldn't really harm it at all. I think what you'd want to do is, this is something where moisture actually might help. So when you get it out, it'll be really, really flat. It'll just look it's like it's squashed and give it a really, really good shake and it'll start puffing up. But there'll be some of the fibers of the down just locked together. So what you need to try and do is actually put a bit of moisture in there and then they'll unlock and then it will be fully lofted. So what you might do is tumble dry it um, on a really cool setting with like a wet towel or something and that'll really puff it up and then it should be totally fine. My supervisor had like a down sleeping bag that came out of the office after like probably 10 years compressed, mm. just flat as a pancake. And we were like, oh, that's useless. And then we tumble dried it with a wet towel and it was like, yeah, literally it's new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. crazy. Okay, so a lot of our products on the mm -hmm. shop floor are yeah. duck down and goose down. Yeah. So what's the difference between the two and how do you choose which one is best in what product? Yeah, it's it's a tricky one because my PhD initially I was trying to find out the difference between goose and duck down. That was basically the whole objective, and I found out the further I went along, there's very little difference between them. There is there is there are differences, but the difference in performance is relatively small. It's more down to fill power. That's the major thing. So if you have a 700 fill power goose down and a 700 fill power duck down, there's very little difference in performance between them. You might argue that goose down is a little bit better at resisting compression, so it might be slightly better. But um, I think 
a lot of the association with goose down being a much better product than, da- than duck down is because historically ducks were, you know, they're sort of, they're common little creatures, they're not like the sort of like grandeur of a, of a goose. Um, and the down used to be washed less effectively, so duck down used to sometimes smell, like particularly if people bought bedding, you know, duck down quite smell, whereas the goose down was the more expensive one, must be better. Nowadays, the, the, gap, the gap in performance between them is much, much smaller. So we tend to use goose down in our pinnacle products. It's our very best material we use in our best products. We use duck down in more products that are less expensive, but they're still, they're still basically premium products, but they're not absolute top of the range mm-hmm. ones. And performance wise, it provides 90% of the performance, but um, roughly half the cost. So it, you know, it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot better value for money, but if you want the absolute best, I think goose down is the way to go. Okay. So some other brands that we yep. stock um, do a mix of down and synthetic insulations mm-hmm. uh, in their jackets yeah. mostly um, and in some of their sleeping bags. Um, so why don't we see that as much from mountain equipment? Yeah, it depends if you're talking about the ones where there's like a sheet of synthetic and bits of down or whether it's down and synthetic fibres all mixed together. The down and synthetic fibre mixed together stuff, um, we did a little bit of testing on this and it seems to be that it provides with composite materials like that, it's just a general thing, you either get the best of both worlds, like something like carbon fibre where you get something really stiff and really strong, or you get the worst of both worlds where it doesn't really work particularly well. And we, we feel like it's in general, you get the sort of the problems with down of it getting wet and not being so insulating, mm-hmm. combined with the synthetic effect in the loft of the down and making it worse. So we, we don't think it's particularly effective. Using down sheets and, uh, sorry, uh, synthetic sheets and loose down together, that's quite interesting and like, We've done a little bit of work on that. It's one of the problems though is that a down jacket might last 10, 15, 20 years and a sleeping bag similarly, but the synthetic is going to lose a lot of performance after relatively little time. Right. Yeah. So you get you end up with an expensive product which isn't going to last as long as a pure down one and you're not necessarily getting huge advantages from both. So that's one of the major reasons and it's it's a, sometimes a tricky selling point as well. Someone will say, Well, is this a down jacket or a synthetic jacket? Oh it's, it's both. Is that mm-hmm. what's it good for then? So it's it's a little bit of a um, almost like a product marketing decision, like how are you going to market that product that's quite difficult. So yeah, it's as much a commercial decision in some ways as a performance decision. Yeah. So when a down product is stored and washed correctly and yeah. really cared for, how mm-hmm. long does it actually last before it starts breaking down and losing its thermal efficiency? Yeah, it, it should last a really long time. It depends from product to product and if things with like a thicker face fabric, which are um, you know really durable thick fabrics, they're going to keep more grease and things like that out of them and things that are worn closer to the skin, there's more grease and, and contamination, they're not going to last as long as something that um, you know, you use on top of all the clothes. So a big, big down jacket where you've got loads of down in it, that's got, you know, it's going to be worn on top of fleece, maybe on top of rubber jackets. That'll last longer than a really thin one that you wear every day. Um, and then it's one reason why you should use a sleeping bag liner. It keeps the down a lot, lot fresher for longer. Um, but yeah, you could, it, they could last like, you know, decades. We quite often see sleeping bags come back to us that are, you know, 30 years old and they finally need a new zip. And basically they're as new. Uh, apart from the music, maybe the fabrics are starting to wear out, but the down's absolutely fine in them. Um, and I've heard stories of like aristocratic families, even the royal family, using eider downs, which have got eider down in, as opposed to goose or duck down in, that are like hundreds of years old, and they've just passed them down like heirlooms. So you know, yeah. it's, it's pretty durable. It's, it's, it's certainly much more durable than any equivalent synthetic material. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's pretty good. I've got some, I should have brought some. Um, I've got like a bag this big and it's worth about 50 quid. It's like, it's a lot of money. Um, <laughs> Just a little bit. Yeah, but yeah, you know, you could, if you buy like Japanese duvets and stuff that are like 20,000 quid, yeah, they've got out of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's only like one, one place that is certified to process out of that. Yeah, so there's, there's... I'm pretty sure it's very, very restricted. It is, it's They're very restricted. Swiss, actually, off the top of my head. Maybe, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, um, most of it's like farmed in Iceland because yeah they, they don't farm them <coughs> they're all wild birds and they're basically a little skilled collector person has to individually pull the feathers out of the nest when the eider birds aren't there so it's like literally feathers at a time um, but it means the result you get 100% down in their flight feathers so it's pretty good you're happy yeah. your jacket took 8 years to make yeah yeah it's <laughs> insane it's, it's why it's expensive yeah, yeah. but um, yeah So when we're looking at your jackets and yeah. your sleeping bags, mm-hmm. we talk a lot about down optimization. Yeah. Now I've been told that you're the brainchild <laughs> of that whole scheme. Um, mm. So, so what is it? Yeah, it, 
this was our sort of term to describe all the nitty gritty behind how much down should you put in certain bits of the jacket. So, you know, should you be um, cramming more in the hood or should you put more in the sleeves, more in the arms? And then scaling that up, that's to sleeping bags where, you know, down is basically everything to a sleeping bag. Not quite, there's a lot of other things, but, um, you know, how you, you've got a lot of down to play with in a sleeping bag and is it more efficient if you put more in the top, more in the bottom? And then also how much do you cram into each, like into the volume of a sleeping bag? So. With the sleeping bag, you've got the length of the baffle, you've got the width of the baffle, and then you've got the depth as well. Mm -hmm. And so you've, you've got a volume there, and then you can work out if you put five grams in there, 10 grams in there, 15 grams in there. And you can work out basically what's the most efficient way of putting in there for like cost, but also for mainly for warmth and also compressibility, um, water resistance, all these things are affected. Yeah. So there's, there's loads and loads of factors that are at play, and you've just got to try and optimize each part of the bag because the demands on the bottom of the sleeping bag are different to the top. The top of the bag is all about just maximum thickness, maximum warmth. Bottom of the bag just has to be compression resistant, has to feel nice, all this sort of thing. Um, something like a collar, you want to make sure that the down moves quite freely so you can you know, get all nice snuggled up in it. Whereas the back of the hood, you just want to keep your head off the ground. If, mm -hmm. if all the down moves nicely and freely in there, you just end up with a cold back of your head. So it's, it's one of those things where you've got to think about the exact use and you do it like that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so let's talk about your Down Codex. Okay. So what is it and what mm -hmm. made you start it? Yeah, so Down Codex has been mountain equipment um, supply chain, traceability and animal auditing welfare standards scheme that's been going for, this is the 10th anniversary year. So it started long before I joined mountain equipment, but it was a you know, really groundbreaking scheme for the industry um, in that it was the first fully traceable um, scheme for Down. And it was, a, it was a going against the trends of the industry. I think a lot of people in the industry, in particular the down and feather industry, said people aren't interested in this and it's, it's impossible. You know, it, it, you can't trace down. It's a really complicated supply chain. Um, and yeah, we, we booked the trend and we managed to do it. So now you get a little barcode inside your products and you can see where the down came from um, and you can read the, wealth, the welfare reports, the audit reports from the independent auditors. Um, so it's a really good scheme. Um, it's had uh, numerous different changes along the way. We're still developing it, um, but it's what's amazing is how much it's the industry has changed around it. So this was the first scheme, and then a couple of years later, there was um, you know articles on the Daily Mail website, there was articles on the Guardian website about um, you know live plucking of birds, and all of a sudden this was this huge issue that the industry had basically ignored until that point. And I think it made people realise that people do care where their products come from. Um, and yeah, now there's you know lots of rival schemes as well. So we're no longer we're no longer alone, but we still believe Codex is a really important place in the marketplace. And it's um, it's a scheme that we work a lot on. We, we're really proud of. So it's a it's, it's a key part of mountain equipment, I think, despite only being fifty about ten years old of a you know, almost sixty year old brand. Okay, so yeah. why don't you use any hydrophobic treatments in yeah. your sleeping bags? Um, there's a couple of reasons. Main one is that. We don't think it necessarily provides that much benefit. Um, so down is pretty hydrophobic anyway, um, and if you get your sleeping bag completely drenched, doesn't matter if your down is hydrophobic or not, you're going to get pretty wet. Mm -hmm. um, but we've worked out that there's a lot of factors that are much more important when it comes to staying dry than the down staying dry itself. So if you were going for a walk in the rain, you wouldn't you know, cover your fleece in hydrophobic material. You would instead wear a waterproof jacket. So we put a lot of water resistant shells on our sleeping bags. Some of our sleeping bags have got Actually, waterproof shells. We can't say that because of uh, God's rules, but they are basically waterproof. They're not. They're not um, seam sealed, but the fabrics are, are pretty much waterproof. Um, so, we have really, really protective shell fabrics. That's a better way of protecting the down than the down itself being proofed. Um, and then also, if you've got a sleeping bag that's going to last you maybe 10, 20 years, and it's going to last you a long, long time, um, we know that hydrophobic treatments don't last that long. You know, if you think of the DWR on your waterproof jacket, um, it doesn't last that long. Um, Inside a sleeping bag is very different, obviously, to being rubbed by rucksack straps and whatever happens to your jacket. But even so, they're not going to last the lifetime of the garment. We don't the lifetime of the sleeping bag, sorry. And we don't think it's necessarily right that people are buying a sleeping bag with a treatment that will last for a, a certain period, and then it, it's really difficult to get back without um, quite a lot of effort. It's hard to proof the down inside a sleeping bag once mm -hmm. you've got the sleeping bag assembled. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a deliberate ploy, it's not some sort of cost saving measure, it's something we, we don't think it basically helps, so we're not putting it in our bags. Okay. Yeah. The other thing is, it's like a, um, 
well, that's probably a bigger applause, you probably should stop there, never mind. Yeah, what I was going to say <laughs> was that um, the... <laughs> what I should have said was, um, you know, people are trying to move away from, uh, you know, more and more treatments, more chemical treatments. We're hearing, hearing all the time about PFCs and things, you know, not all treatments that go on sleeping bags are um, contain PFCs, but, you know, in a world where we're trying to reduce the amount of environmental impact, the re- reduce the amount of chemicals put on the things, you're taking this beautiful natural product, you strip all the oils off it, which make it hydrophobic, because geese and ducks don't sink, and then you put on loads of ones that, you know, are, are man-made and not necessarily that nice for the environment. So, yeah, if you don't need them, try not to use them. Yeah. Yeah. That's not a question I was going to ask again. Okay. But do the sterilisation process um, yeah. that down goes through before it's made yeah, into a product, does that yeah. strip the feathers of all of the natural oils as It well? does, basically, yeah, because yeah. the, the, the oils um, cause a lot of smell. That was a smell problem that I mentioned earlier. And, and it's also, they're, they're covered in, you know, all the bits of thing that you will get on a live animal so there's all sorts of stuff on them and yeah it's, it's just through a cleaning process and you and sterilization process as well um, but yeah it strips off a lot of the oils that cause the stink but it also stops them clumping together because obviously mm-hmm. on a bird they won't clump because they are attached to an animal so they're, they're all nicely spread out whereas you know it might want to start clumping if it's all just covered in you know oil and things mm-hmm. so yeah if someone wanted to do an absolutely amazing but extremely difficult project they could work out what the chemicals are on down they could then work out to chemically modify them so they didn't smell but kept them hydrophobic it would be a mind-notly difficult chemical project chemistry project but it'd be really cool because then you get a fully hydrophobic down still which was yeah non non-odorous and was still really insulating so that would be a cool project but it would be pretty hard So how much moisture will down yeah. put up with before it loses all of its loft and all of its insulating properties? Yeah. So take into account that, so this is uh, mm-hmm. non-fancy face fabric, yeah. so not coated, yeah, not, yeah. Um, and just bog standard yeah, down, yeah. not hydrophobically treated. Yeah, yeah. Um, so say you're out trekking in the Brecon Beacons and okay. you get stuck in a massive rainstorm in Yeah, yeah, yeah. How long is it going to be roughly? Yeah, it that's, it's, it's tricky because it depends on how much you're raining or whatever, but yeah, it, it certainly could be pretty quick. You could get wet yeah. quite quickly. Um, and it depends a lot on the baffle size actually. So if you've got like a really narrow baffle down jacket, mm-hmm. you've got more stitch lines, you know, the, there's more water coming in from more places. So if you've got a thicker jacket, it'll, it'll last longer. Um, and there's, there's various other variables that I'll try not to go into, but basically I would say if it's raining really hard, your down jacket's going to be pretty pretty damp after half an hour, mm-hmm. and it's going to be pretty horrible to wear after an hour, I'd say. Yeah. 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 But hopefully you've got a walkthrough with you or something else. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so with the way that technology yeah. is going, do you think that um, synthetic insulation will one mm. day be able to match the uh, insulating properties yeah. and also the durability of down products? It's got a lot of work to do. Um, it's got a lot of work to catch up on. Um, down's just had so many millions of years to evolve. Um, synthetic we've only been doing for 100 years or so. So that's certainly going to be difficult. Um, but in certain situations, synthetic's already better than down. If you're doing you know, Scottish winter climbing, you want a big belay jacket or you, you're out in hot weather all the time, now, down is not so good as synthetic in the rain, though, you know, if it's raining a lot, you do need a waterproof jacket as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, basically, it's just got so much work to do to catch up on the water to weight ratio that it's going to struggle. However, um, synthetic's got so many more ideas for construction that hasn't been used yet. There's loads of unique constructions that we're just starting to explore, and there's this new blown fill that's synthetic, so a synthetic fill that's blown into a jacket like down. Um, that's just really exciting that's really different um, and it gives you more loft than traditional synthetic so you know there's a lot of jackets that do really well in the marketplace now but we've not seen any of that stuff in, in sleeping bags yet you now that could be an interesting avenue to go down there's loads of room for in innovation in synthetics and that's what's really interesting at the moment for, for me at least like we've got jackets that are in work for <coughs> yeah, another couple of years until they hit the marketplace but they're being tested right now and First sign's good, yeah, and but you know whether we'll ever get to the point where people will be walking up Everest and summiting Everest in synthetic suit rather than a down suit. I'm not sure, we're a little way away, a little way to go, I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah. there's something really exciting happening at Mountain Equipment, yeah. uh, and we're stocking the products in from this spring. Mm-hmm. So this is the Earthrise project, yeah, uh, and the Down Cycle. Yeah, yeah. Is that what it's called? Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> What is it and yeah. how can we get involved? Okay, yeah, so 
Earthrise are products that contain 100% recycled down feathers and they've also got recycled face fabrics and recycled lining fabrics. So basically, apart from zips and you know, trim like um, zip pullers, they're 100% mm -hmm. recycled. Um, the down's really exciting because it's basically the same performance as Virgin Down. It's not quite, but it's very, very close. Um, and yet it's from post-consumer waste. So this is all bedding, all pillows and things like this, all sleeping bags that have been uh, recycled, then it's fully cleaned, it's fully sterilised, so there's no sort of hygiene issues at all, it's as clean as Virgin Down, and instead of going to landfill, it just gets used again, so we put it into new jackets, so it's, it's a really good way to reuse stuff, and at first I was a bit sort of cynical, um, I thought, you know, Down is not necessarily a product that's a big problem in landfill because it biodegrades and things, um, and the energy used in, because it's a byproduct of the meat industry, I thought, well, what's the big issue, but actually, you know, why would you just get a product that's perfectly good and just dump it in the ground? You know, you're better off just reusing it. And the energy costs of reusing it and cleaning it and stuff are actually quite small. Um, we work with a partner that have like really, really good wastewater recycling. The, the plant is powered by solar energy. It's like a super clean process. So yeah, on all the eco ground, it's a, it's a brilliant product. Um, down cycle is super exciting because what we're trying to do there is instead of taking um, down from third party products, which are not necessarily mountain equipment products, Downcycle is about taking back products from the outdoor industry uh, and mountain equipment products. We want to see people returning stuff that's just too, too tatty to wear, that they can't um, donate, they can't um, get any use out of. It might be completely broken, it might be covered in oil, you know, it just might be completely ruined, um, or simply a product you don't want to wear anymore, don't want to use anymore, and you, you know, no one wants to have it. Um, and we can take the down out of those products and then clean it sterilize it, sort it, make sure it's really good quality, then put it into new products. So yeah, no one's done this before as far as we know. And this closed loop recycling is obviously like ultimate recycling. You end up with very, very little waste. Um, so yeah, it's a super exciting project. And uh, basically if you want to get involved, um, yeah, we want your really tatty old sleeping bags. We want your really tatty down jackets. We want the back basically. So yeah, you can, um, we're working out the final details on how to send the back. But there's a big project that's going to kickstart in the next couple of months. And yeah, if you've got anything like that, get in touch with our um, product team from information email or something like that. And uh, yeah, we'll give you more information. Great. Yeah. We will put a link in the bio to um, for an email address so that you can get in contact with these guys if you have any products that you yep. want to check their way. Great. Yeah. So a bit, mm. bit of a subjective question. Yep. So what's your favourite piece from the range and why? Oh. And it doesn't have to be down. I know we've been talking about down, down yeah, ranges, yeah, yeah. but it doesn't have to be down. Oh, I think I'm going to pick down anyway. So uh. yeah. <laughs> Um, when we did the sleeping bags, we released the sleeping bags for spring summer seventeen or the down sleeping bags. It was a it was an enormous project for um, three people who were relatively new to the brand, and I think it was a it was a really good time for us to spend a lot of time um, doing a project that we were all really really excited about. We had a lot of time to do it, and there was a lot of responsibility on us. This was like you know really important pro product category for mountain equipment, um, and there was a few models in that in that development that were like you know the the. Uh, the axe was waiting to fall on them. I think they were the sort of ones that people were looking at commercially going, we can't sell many of those. That is a, that is a niche product. And we were really adamant that they would work. Um, and one of them in particular was the Fire Flash sleeping bag, which the, uh, the, the sort of thing we had in mind was, sub one kilo, how warm can you make a sleeping bag that's still got all the proper features, like it's still got full length zip, it's got a proper hood, um, it's got a proper really good foot box. Um, it's got lightweight fabrics, but not so light, they're gonna fall apart. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we, we thought, right, that's going to be a really good sleeping bag. And, and, it's, and it's, been, it's, it's not sold millions and millions, but it's sold relatively well. Um, everyone who's used one absolutely loves them. They're extremely warm. They're far warmer than the um, sleeping bag testing suggests. Um, and then uh, Tom Livingston recently used one on the top one, the first ascent from the north, which was a super massive ascent. It's not the sort of thing I would want to use. I would want to use a much bigger sleeping bag if I was going to 7,000 yeah. meters. But you know, Tom's definitely pushing it. He just wants the lightest bag that's really, really warm. And yeah, he said he wasn't entirely warm throughout, but yeah, that's the bag he used along with a custom bag we made in the office, which was a two person bag. So there were three of them and they basically rotated around between the fire flash and the, the two person bag we made in the office. So yeah, that was, a, that was basically, a, it was a really good project where we had, uh, the sleep mode project in general was just really exciting for, for me particularly because I was just like fresh out of PhD world and thrown into commercial land. Um, and it worked out. Yeah, so that was good. That was really good. That's a, and that's a good product as well, so yeah. Great. So yeah. what do you listen to to get you in the mood for a long day of brainstorming and yeah. design work? 
I think more than anything else, I'd probably listen to other people in the office, which is a lame answer. But yeah, yeah, no, generally, we, we don't do that much, like, <laughs> brainstorming on our own. It's all like, you know, like, we, we have a fairly fluid design office where just everyone is constantly back, batting ideas back and forth. I think sitting in a little box trying to go, innovate, innovate, doesn't really work. But if you've got people to discuss with, it's, it's far, far better. But then, once you're on your own and you've got, you know, you put your headphones on, then, yeah, I usually listen to, like, Boost 6 Music, that'd be the radio station I'd listen to. Okay. And then, like, yesterday, I had I had this massive spreadsheet to do really quickly so I just put on a, a load of pendulum so yeah drum right. bass yeah <laughs> yeah that worked yeah perfect great yeah. <laughs> that's a other people in the office yeah yeah I, d- I don't have them on my headphones though yeah that would be a bit weird yeah <laughs> okay great and that's it for today guys thank you very much for watching it all this way and thank you very much Matt for no coming problem. in today that yeah. was really kind no, of thanks. you yeah, no problem at all. Uh, as usual if you have any more questions then do pop them in the comment section below and we will get back to you um, and if you love this video then subscribe and see what comes out next thanks guys yeah. oh and we will put a link in the bio to uh, Matt's PhD paper if you'd like to have a read of that thanks <laughs> <Good luck>. <laughs> <laughs>